Welcome to Genfei TV, and this is TY. So in this episode, uh, I'm going to share with you um, three cross-string scales I really love, okay? So the first one is by thirds, starting from A, first string, okay? So when you're at home, you can just pause this video or play at 0 0.5 speeds or watch it over again. I'll go very slow, okay, so... And then... Okay, now let's go up. Okay, I ended on extra note G just so we can end on downbeat. Okay, so we are going to put our thumb on the bass string uh, to help, and then using red strokes, or you can do free strokes on the uh, rotating fingers on the top treble uh, fingers, IMA fingers. Um, so this exercise is great for normal order cross string and backwards cross string. So what are those? So normal order cross string is when you have the middle finger playing the top string and I finger naturally play the lower string. And backwards is like this. Like, this is very awkward for us, it's really hard. So this exercise is great for both. So first you can start with I finger. So on the way down is all backwards, so. so all backwards, 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 and then on the way up is normal order. And now let's reverse using M first. So M I M I. And then M. This is backwards. Okay, now let's move on to the second exercise. Second exercise is uh, three steps going down, okay? So, la so fa, so fa mi, fa mi re, mi re do. Okay, that's so fish, or you can like A, G, F, G, F, E, etc. Okay, so this one you can use either starting with I or M. It does not matter that much because we're going by three, number three. So, so you will be tested backwards and the front words, normal order, uh, uh, like, on the way, as always, so don't worry about this one. Okay, so A, G, F, and G, F, E, descending. Okay, now let's do the last exercise of this, cross string exercise. Four notes going down, okay? So in this time, we're going to start with A also. So, and then G. are the three very very helpful exercises for us to conquer all the cross string difficulties uh, in the scales in the pieces okay uh, so just remember if you could using metronome to do the exercise so what you can do is how do we set metronome for the lowest speed and the top speed when you practice so you can test out every week I try to use five to ten speeds 
Okay, you can buy buy five or buy ten increments, and then the beginning speed should be the speed you can play when you just walk up. Uh, I you barely um feel ready to play, and your hands are stiff, but you. In that speed, you can you should be still be able to play with highest quality. So that is your beginning speed. Okay, so very slow speed. You can play at any time, like frozen hands. Uh, you can still play well, and then slightly going up by five or ten, five to ten speeds. And the highest speed you should do is kind of ninety percent of your limit speed, where you barely can maintain your quality. Okay, so say. I can play one eighty, uh, but I barely kind of almost nearly breaking down the quality, and you. So I suggest you practice like one sixty five to one seventy as your top speed. So try to, uh, using that ladder, uh, of speed to help us to grow the fingers, uh, more constructively. Okay. See you in the next episode. Greetings and hello, I'm Zeno Miller II, a classical guitarist, musical lover, and connoisseur of plucked stringed perfection, and today we're going to close our discussion on Andre Segovia. In the last two episodes, we discussed who Andre Segovia was in a nutshell, we talked about the music he created, and today we're going to be talking about what he left behind. If you're just joining us now, Andre Segovia was a famous Spanish classical guitarist who is oftentimes considered the father of the classical guitar. He redefined the guitar by getting many composers who weren't guitarists to write for the guitar, and he put the guitar in a spotlight for musicians everywhere. So yeah, we're just going to talk about what he left behind today and some of the pupils he taught who have a direct influence on the way we play guitar today. The first and maybe one of the most important physical contributions of Andre Segovia was that he helped in aiding the creation of the nylon string with Albert Augustine. Before Segovia's nylon string, strings were made out of cat gut. And although it wasn't a cat's gut, and it was actually cow intestines, mm. I don't know if that makes it any better, but there was actually a shortage of catgut during World War II, which forced guitarists to find alternative methods to having strings for their guitars. Catgut was used for everything. Tennis rackets, all sorts of stringed things. There's an airplane. Once Segovia and Albert Augustine came up with the perfect string, Segovia played with it for the rest of his career and never ever changed back. Thing number two, Segovia played concerts his whole entire life, and he died when he was 94 years old. After he passed away, his throne was left vacant for some guitarist to occupy. Who would that be, you might be asking? To a large degree, this throne of Andre Segovia was occupied by two guitarists, Julian Bream and John Williams some of the coolest guitar guys out there. We're about to take a look at that. English guitarist Julian Bream and Australian guitarist John Williams were both phenomenal players, and they definitely filled most of the seat that Segovia had left behind. But they were also vastly different, a little bit more progressive, but shared a lot of the same values that Segovia had in terms of making the guitar something more than it was. Julian Bream was born in 1933 and got a guitar at the age of 11 from his father. He quickly fell in love with it, growing up with the music of Django Reinhardt and other sorts of gypsy jazz musicians. John Williams was a few years younger than Julian Bream, born in 1941, and like Julian Bream, his father was a guitarist and also taught him and helped him in his guitar career. Both of these guitarists had a close connection with Segovia in one way or another. Julian Bream had played on the radio many times, and when Segovia visited in England, he got to play for the maestro himself. Segovia said that Julian Bream would become very famous one day. He did just that. Williams, on the other hand, started lessons with Andre Segovia when he was 12. He developed a precise technique, and Segovia was dumbfounded by his technical ability. It was just crazy to see what this guy could do on the guitar, and his technique, at its finest, still stands up to the best players of today, which is just insane. 
I've been asked the question whether I prefer Bream's or Williams, but I don't know if I have a definitive answer. Depending on the genre, um, the era, the recording, I my preference changes. Exactly the same. Never. Well, at least I hope they're not. You've got to, if you like, be a little bit reckless. Dreams and Williams toured just as extensively as Andre Segovia, but something that set them apart was that they were willing to play in places that Segovia normally wouldn't, and play music that Segovia normally wouldn't. They were superstars, and eventually, in the most ambitious crossover since Avengers Infinity War, they even played together. Although Segovia wanted the guitar to be something fancy, Bremen Williams didn't care so much about that image. Although they played most of their concerts in large concert halls, Bremen Williams could be found playing in jazz clubs and smaller, smaller lounges to spread the word of the guitar on an intimate level. Bremen Williams were also really famous for being progressive and collaborating with different instruments from all over the world. We can't talk about these great collaborations without talking about the full-on musical and compositional contributions of John Williams and Julian Bream. First of all, let's get something straight. John Williams is not John Williams. John Williams was just a guitar player, and he came from Australia. The other John Williams, no. Um, <laughs> John Williams did end up composing later in his life, but most of his guitar career was spent playing. Bream, on the other hand, was editor extraordinaire. If anyone picked up the torch that Segovia left behind for creating new compositions on the guitar, it would have been Bream. But Bream, again, had more progressive views, and the guitar blew up into a contemporary instrument that we get to appreciate today. Not only did Bream champion the existing repertoire, but he also introduced a lot of guitarists to the music of John Dowland, which was played on the lute. Many modern composers such as Toru Takamitsu, Leo Brower, Malcolm Arnold, and Benjamin Britten, to name a few, all wrote pieces for Mr. Julian Bream. He also played a lot of music that Andre Segovia would have rejected and created it into this beautiful 20th century guitar album that you should go listen to right now. Actually, after this video is done because I'm almost there. John Williams wasn't just playing guitar. Even though he didn't edit as much as Julian Bream did, he helped do something amazing, and that was bring the Paraguayan composer Augustin Barrios into light. Augustin Barrios meant so much to people in Central America, but in the grand scheme of the world, his music wasn't very widely known. So John Williams released an album of just Barrios' music, and his music exploded crazy, crazy awesome, totally cool. <laughs> John Williams also redefined the spaces that classical guitar could and should be a part of. He even played classical guitar in areas that Segovia would have detested. His modern pop progressive rock band Sky had sort of this electric classical kind of vibe. You should listen to it right now. One more thing I have to mention about John Williams. John Williams was famous for playing the guitars of the Australian luthier Greg Smallman. Greg Smallman believed that the guitar should be played in the largest concert halls and should have no problem projecting all the way to the back of the hall. Williams worked very, very closely with Mr. Smallman to help create a guitar that could do just that. Many people today play Smallman guitars and his name is of legend in the luthier world. There are so many shops that make replicas of Smallman guitars, and the contributions of Greg Smallman are not going to be soon forgotten. Both Williams and Bream are superstars who are still worshipped today. The classical guitar story doesn't end there, but we'll have to wait and uncover that in a later episode of Xeno Introduces.
Before I roll the credits and give my thank yous, there's one last thing I would like to appreciate. And if it wasn't for this, Freeman Williams maybe wouldn't have had the amazing success that they have today. And that thing is the fashion. Sometimes when I'm down and out, I like to rock my own Julian Bream and John Williams fashion. Maybe someday I could do a closet breakdown of John Williams and Julian Bream. But for now, I think it's time that you get on your way to the next segment. I'll talk to you soon. Take care, stay safe, and happy practicing. Today we will continue with um, uh, ascending motion, lower to higher notes, but this time now we're going to add to three finger combination. So we started with one individual finger, then we did two, and you see where I'm going. I will do three, and then eventually we move to four finger combination. Okay? So in this one, we're going to use all kind, only ascending, one direction. So we'll do uh, let's say we start with one and the third string. So you again drop, find the third string, third finger, and then see the second and first where they position. And then you're gonna start doing one, two, and three. And in the right hand, you can do I, M, A, or, or repeat if you want with only one finger. So second string, you will play with M, first string will play with A, just for the sake of not getting all complicated too much. You can repeat the finger as soon as you relax and then eventually you can do combinations of different fingers. So one, two, and three, maintaining the arch, make sure you don't touch upon the lower string. Remember, if you are too flat, you will touch. If you go too forward, then you have too much wrist out. It's just right balance. So you are straight down into the string, straight down into the fingerboard. So one, two, three, weight transfer. See, releasing the other fingers behind. One, two, three. One, two, three. Second string. One, two, three. 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 Relaxing every finger, not pressing on the thumb behind. The thumb is always barely touching. It's only to create balance and you feel the sense of weight from the elbow. Don't overdo it either, you know, just enough to get sound, just like the exercise that we did in the first one. So that was one, two, three. Then we're gonna do other combinations. Now we have uh, one, two, four. The same principle of weight transfer, transfer to second and release first, to four and release second. Then first string, one, two, four, 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 one, two, four. It's like we are walking over the fingerboard. And, and remember, you don't have to do all six strings. You can start only with the first three on the center three, the fourth, third, and second string, or fifth, fourth, and second, and third, and then eventually add more strings until you get the full range of the opposite width of the guitar from first to sixth string, okay? And little by little, if you're feeling comfortable, remember you can move the capo back one fret at a time until you get all the way into first position with no capo and you feel comfortable about it. The idea is that when you start playing on first, you have to, you know, depending on your position, your arm will always have to reach a little bit farther. And as a result, there's always a tendency of leaning this way. And we're trying to away. See, part of the way of, of getting the capo is to keep your body center and so everything is close to you rather than just farther away, okay? Especially when you have guitars that are bigger than the size that you should have. So we did one, two, four. Then after that, we're gonna do one, three, four. 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 Weight shifting. Remember.
with your thumb. Okay? And then finally, two, three, four. Two, three, four. Two, three, four. Two, three, four. Two. Walking on this guitar, third string. And if you're comfortable only with the first three strings, just stay there. In this case, I'm gonna keep on going to the fifth, and then six, two, three, four. Third string, two, three, four. Fourth string, two, three, four. And finish on third. Going back to the center of the guitar, the same principle, okay? So, to review, we did three finger combinations. One, two, three. One, two, four, one, three, four, and finish with two, three, four. Okay? And again, you're gonna move as many strings as you're comfortable with. You can start with group of two, group of three, then add the fourth finger, uh, the fourth string, then add the fifth string, eventually reaching the entire. And then at the beginning, you're gonna do it very slow, but little by little, you wanna increment your speed with control and even without gaps in between, okay? Well, thank you for watching and good luck with your practice. I haven't heard any scales today. Good grief. Hey, this is Dr. V and we are going to try to help Chuck have a little more fun in his scale practice. You ready, Chuck? Oh yeah, anything to make scales a little more fun. So what we're gonna do is make a DIY backing track to practice our scales on top of. So let's just start in the key of C with our one, four, five progression. Do you remember what our one, four, and five are in the key of C? Uh, one is C, F is four, G is five, and G seven would be five, seven. Okay, yeah, I can do that. That's really good. So what we want to do is you want to hit the record button on your phone and then you're going to count before you start and then you're going to play your progression. When you're done, just hit the stop button. One, two, three, four. Now that you've created a C major backing track, you can practice the C major scale on top of it. Give it a try. Okay, I hope this works. One, two, three, four. <laughs> pretty fun. Well, that was fantastic, Chuck. So now let's spice things up a little bit. Let's do something a little jazzy. Ooh, I like jazz. So instead of doing a 1-4-5 progression, we're going to do a 2-7-5-7-1-7 progression. Now, in a major key, the 2-7 is going to be a minor 7 chord, the 5 7 is going to be a dominant 7 chord, which we've done before, and the 1 7 will be a major 7 chord. So, what chords would those be? So, 2 7 is D minor 7, 5 7 is G7, and 1 7 is C major 7. Ooh, I like that chord. Okay, cool. That was absolutely correct. So, do like you did before. Count off and record your progression. 
One, two, three, four. I can't wait to try this one. One, two, three, four. <laughs> going to the relative minor which is a minor and in a minor key it's most common to have the two chord as a half diminished seven chord your five chord is going to be dominant seven and your one chord is going to be a minor seven chord so what chords will you have two seven is b half diminished seven um Five would be E7 and A minor 7 for 1. Okay, that was absolutely correct. So now count off, record your progression, and then try that A harmonic minor scale on for size. All right, here we go. The two, a one, two, three, four. <laughs> And so now I think you understand better the benefits of playing your scales. And it can be fun. So keep it up and happy practicing.